Dell's new XPS 14 and 16 laptops are stunning. They feel incredibly premium and all the latest tech has been packed inside. But they are stupidly expensive and once you use them for a while, there are so many things that are going to frustrate you, especially if you're using these for anything that requires performance. Now, at the time of this review, the XPS 14 starts at $1,700, which sounds pretty tasty. That is for the base model with no dedicated graphics, a Core Ultra 7 processor, 16 gb of memory and 512 gb of storage. But for that price, you're getting a low 1920 by 1200 resolution display. Once you stretch those pixels across this large 14.5 inch panel, that is only 154 pixels per inch, making everything look pixelated and hazy. A MacBook Pro for comparison has a PPI of 254. Folks, in 2024, no other laptop that I can find above $1,000 has a resolution this low. And if it does, it shouldn't. But it gets worse. The XPS 16 starts at $1,900, $200 more, same memory, storage and no dedicated graphics. It still has a 1920 by 1200 resolution display. On a large 16.3 inch panel like this one, it is an even worse PPI of 139. Our model that had this display, I personally couldn't even look at for more than a couple of minutes. Everything looked so pixelated. So he made me use it instead. To be charging almost $2,000 for laptops with these displays is a disgrace. Now, both these laptops can be upgraded to high resolution panels, but that will cost you an extra $300. Our XPS 14 does have the upgraded OLED panel. It looks very nice. But while looking at white content closely, its screen door effect is very noticeable. The white looks like it has a lot of little dots on it. Anyway, with these upgraded panels, which really should be included in the base models, the XPS 14 now costs $2,000 and the 16 2200 So let's see how they hold up versus their competitors at this price point. In Geekbench, which tests a variety of common performance tasks, the XPS 14 performs around the same as HP's newly redesigned Spectre 14. Now, that laptop comes with twice the memory and four times the storage, and it costs less. And when compared to the MacBook Pro 14 with the M3 Pro 11 core, this laptop gets crushed in single core and smashed in multi-core. And the MacBook Pro costs the same as this one, and it comes with two gigabytes more memory. Switching to Cinebench, which tests how these laptops perform when their CPUs are maxed out. Both the XPS 14 and 16 once again perform about the same as laptops that cost far less. And they're way behind Apple's MacBook Pros. To add insult to injury, those laptops also draw less power, last longer on battery and don't drop their performance on battery like these XPS laptops do. But when we look at graphics, things completely fall apart. Even the base MacBook Pro 14 with the M3 Pro 11 core has much more powerful graphics than the XPS 14's default integrated one. Now, you can upgrade the XPS 14 with an NVIDIA RTX 4050 for a disgraceful $400 more. But the XPS 14 only feeds its 4050 40 watts of power. NVIDIA's own spec states that a laptop 4050 should be fed between 35 and 115 watts of power. Power. That makes this RTX 4050 one of the most underpowered in any laptop on the market. For comparison, Lenovo's 14 inch Yoga Pro 9i feeds its RTX 4050 80 watts, and that laptop costs significantly less. No surprise as the XPS performs terribly in graphical tasks when compared to other laptops with dedicated GPUs. Now, if you do buy this 14 inch laptop with that upgraded graphics and one terabytes of storage, all of a sudden you're at 2,500 US dollars. That is more than the MacBook Pro 14 12 core that has more memory and destroys this laptop on every conceivable metric. And if you don't want to buy a Mac, you can save close to $1,000 by buying Asus's new G14. That has a much more powerful RTX 4060 that is fed the appropriate amount of wattage. Or, and you aren't going to believe this, you can save $300 and buy a Razer Blade 14. And that laptop's memory is upgradable, unlike these ones. When in history has a laptop reviewer said that you can save money by buying a Blade? I mean, what planet are we on here? And things get worse for the XPS 16. With 32 gig of memory, one terabytes of storage, a Core Ultra 9 and an RTX 4070, the price is over $3,500. That is more than a MacBook Pro 16 with an M3 Max chip and also Lenovo's Yoga Pro 9i. And just like the XPS 14, the 16 feeds its dedicated graphics far less power than normal. 
Now, Dell would argue that by feeding these laptops less power, they are keeping the operating temperatures cooler to the touch with less fan noise. But even though in benchmarks this somewhat plays out, in real world use it really doesn't. For performance tasks, these run far warmer to the touch and have more fan noise than the MacBook Pros. When editing a video on my XPS 16 with its RTX 4060, you could clearly hear the fans going. When I switched to my older MacBook Pro 16 with the M2 Max chip, there was no fan noise at all. Plus, the Mac felt noticeably snappier for that task, whereas the XPS 16 always felt like there was a little lag. Folks, I need to take a break here. I am way too worked up. The keyboard is comfortable to type on. The key presses are nice and quiet and they feel satisfying. Great for using in a quiet classroom or office. But the keyboard layout makes it challenging to use. You will frequently miss hit keys due to their odd size and weird locations. The left and right arrow keys are large, but the up and down keys are ridiculously tiny. Josh's fingers were too big to press them, so he was regularly hitting the wrong key and yelling atrocities. Something to note, the edges of these laptops are sharp, so if you're using them somewhere without adequate support for your arms, like on a plane's tray table, the laptop will cut into your wrists. To make way for the combo power button fingerprint reader, the backspace key is moved to the left from where it normally is. On multiple occasions, I accidentally locked the laptop by mispressing the key while trying to backspace. And the XPS 16's keyboard is worse than the 14's. It has some really odd sized keys. The tilde key is massive, as is the caps lock key. I frequently mispressed the caps lock only to later discover I had been typing in uppercase. Look, if this is your only keyboard, you might get used to it. But if you're swapping between this and a regular keyboard, you're going to have to frequently glance down to check you're pressing the right key. And that's the big issue that I have with the function row. Dell have continued with their headstrong determination to remove the physical function buttons. Apple has tried this before with their touch bar. People hated it and for good reason. It's hard to remember where those keys are when there are no physical buttons. So you are constantly glancing down, which slows you down. And people use these. For example, those doing data analysis in Excel use F2 to quickly edit a cell. Those doing programming use F5 to compile code. Look, sometimes you can remap these keys, but it isn't as efficient as using the keys that you've been using for your entire life. The worst issue though is the lack of a physical escape key. There are so many examples where quick access to that key is needed. You're editing a video and you've accidentally selected the wrong footage. You reach for the escape key at the top left of the keyboard, but on this one, that's the tilde key. Heck, even in a game of League of Legends, I tried to buy something from the store and then press the escape key to exit the store. The couple of seconds that I lost trying to find the escape key was enough for my enemy to destroy my nexus and win the game. Even Apple realized the importance of a physical escape key and put it back in their last iteration of the touch bar. Look, Dell claims that they have removed the physical function row because they needed more space for cooling. But as I showed you earlier, even without the function row, they aren't able to run their dedicated graphics at close to the wattage they should. These laptops are just way too much form over function. And talking about form, the Platinum version of these laptops looks stunning. It really does. But they have light coloured keys with a light coloured backlight. The lack of contrast makes the keys very hard to read in certain lighting conditions. The haptic touchpad is embedded into the palm rest. It looks great as you don't see the usual cutout. But on my XPS 16, I found it didn't respond properly when trying to scroll. It kind of jolted like it wasn't sure if I was scrolling up or down. And when trying to select something, often it opened the right click menu instead. It also had bad palm rejection. The cursor frequently jumped to a different line while typing on the keyboard. Now, I want to say this in defense of the XPS. The XPS 14 that I was using had a perfect touchpad. It worked flawlessly and I really liked it. Now, as we said, these laptops do look great, they really do, and they're also very slim, but they're actually really heavy. The XPS 14 is much heavier than other laptops, even the MacBook Pro 14, which is known for being a bulkier 14 inch laptop. Same for the XPS 16, it's heavier than all its major competitors. This makes carrying around these laptops a chore. When it comes to ports, this year's XPS's are a step back. You have three USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports and a headphone mic combo jack, just as before. But now you have a micro SD card reader. Gone is the full sized one. This is particularly weird given how large the 16 inch XPS is. There is also no HDMI port and no USB-A ports. Dell does include a small dongle in the box that gives you these ports, but who wants to carry around a dongle everywhere that you're just going to lose? Look. 
not all hair is bad. These laptops are some of the best looking ones out there, as I've repeatedly said. For light use, like browsing the web and writing documents, they are very snappy. They have very little fan noise and they remain comfortably cool to the touch. We were also surprised by how good their webcams are. And with regards to the XPS 14 specifically, I really liked the larger 14.5 inch panel over the usual 14. I found the additional space very helpful, and I personally got used to its keyboard and found its trackpad excellent. So for those looking for a stunning laptop for light use that aren't planning to carry their laptop around and have lots of money, you'll enjoy these new XPS laptops. But the problem we have with these is there are just so many better options available, many of which that cost a lot less. If you can use macOS, you'll find that Apple's MacBook Pros are substantially better than these laptops. Performance, battery, fan noise, speakers, keyboard, everything is better on a MacBook Pro. And if you want a Windows alternative, the Spectre 14 is better than the XPS 14 for light users. And the G14 is much more powerful than the XPS 14 if that's what you're looking for. When it comes to the XPS 16, the new Yoga Pro 9i for 2024 smashes it, and the Yoga costs a fraction of its price. Look, in 2016, Apple put components in their MacBook Pros that could not run at full performance. They were too powerful to be cooled in their small chassis. Yet, they charged you top dollar for these upgrades. They also removed useful ports and replaced the physical function row. It was a colossal failure and they had to change course. Dell are repeating these mistakes, and it's destroying our beloved XPS line. It is the equivalent of what Disney did to Star Wars. If you like this video, show your support by smashing that like button and getting subscribed. Unlike on these XPS laptops, those buttons are where you expect them to be. Plus, it helps us grow this channel and put Josh through therapy, which he is going to need after this review. Don't forget to check out our website for all the laptops we recommend for different types of users, as well as where to go to get the best deals on them. Till next time, go do something awesome with your day, and we will catch you later.